the third one is data. Data is what uh, Roy was talking about, right? Pivot tables, manipulating data. In a large sense, what data means is working with working with volumes and volumes of information. When we think of volumes and information, what do we think? Spreadsheets. That's most common, and that's the only one emphasis I want to make. Not that by any way am I um, glossing over things, but we go into great detail, and I, you know, it gets boring at some point listen to me talk. So we should go into the activity. But I want to bring this point across before I move to the next big idea. I, like everybody else, until I went into a meeting, said, "Data means I can only think of rows and columns, a database, a SQL database, fields." Name of a person, first name, last name, age, gender. How about pixels of an image? Right? That formed into a monitor. Or a digital picture that's taken. Pixels. Pixels. Pixels in an image. Music patterns. Mm -hmm. Right? Videos. All these are also you can find data patterns. Let me tell you one that my student worked on. I was blown, blown away. She found the number of occurrences of a word in the Bible. Mm -hmm. The word T-H-E or something, the, or the top of T. Right. And that, that's pattern, that's pattern magic. So really what we wanted to emphasize to the kids is data is about finding patterns in large volumes of data. Why large volumes? Otherwise, if it was smaller volumes, you'll have outliers. And they may not necessarily be a pattern. So in order to be absolutely sure it's a pattern, you want to have large, large, I mean, we are talking thousands, tens of thousands. This, and uh, the, the article that Dr. Gray gave you is a phenomenal, the best article out there on big data. It's very, very good. And it gives you a very good insight. It's a great introductory one. And it is, I will say, on a scale of one to five, the one being the least, Five, uh, one being the least interesting to five being the most interesting, kids get fascinated the most with this. The kids love it. Um, every year, I do this particular scaffolding set of activities, and I think Jill's going to lead one tomorrow for you guys, which is very similar to what I do. You guys fill that survey, didn't you? Um, the, my class numbers doubled. I do it right before recruiting, before uh, we sign up for the next course. First year it was 15, next year it went to 30, next year it went to 66. I purely give it for the data section. And uh, Jill will definitely go more detail into it tomorrow for you guys. Um, I do want you to take back that data is not just rows and columns, but it also can be volumes of unorganized data. Um, <coughs> algorithms. We did algorithms yesterday. Yes? Mm. Which one? Which of the activities do you think was more algorithmic than the other? You had to put the cards in the correct order. Right? Did you say that was? What did the match mind give you an idea on? S sequencing steps. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So if, if putting the cards in sequencing, so the, the team building activity was sequencing, and match mind gave you the detailing, right? How, how detailed you have to be, how very, very specific. Garbage in, garbage out, right? If you don't give proper specific information, you're not going to be able to get the output that you want. Students need to understand that. It's very frustrating for them when they don't get it. And that's what really, I mean, again, SNAP pretty much hides all the requests. It, it glosses over the need for it to be that detailed, but that's a very particular thing to keep in mind. Um, in algorithms, I want to point something to you folks. If you would look at page 18, 4.2.4, evaluate algorithms analytically, empirically for efficiency, correctness, and clarity. And 4.2.3, please, page 17, one, one page before. So in fact, all of those in 4.2. 4.2.1, 4.2.2, 4.2.3, and 4.2.4. So I'll, I'll go through just the first and the second, and then you can see what, a, what the challenge that is. 
4.2.1 explain the difference between algorithms that run in a reasonable time and those that do not run in a reasonable time. Isn't that vague? 4.2.1 explain the difference between algorithms that run in a reasonable time and those that do not run in a reasonable time. What is reasonable time? Well, these days, 20 years ago, you could, I think you could notice that now computers are so fast. I mean, how do you teach this? It's still important, though, when you really look at some of the processes, timing is incredibly important. Even, even if you have, uh, just to throw this out, because this is something I've been wondering about. I remember when I was doing my Pascal courses, we had to be mindful of issues pertaining to storage, you know, for the programs that we were, we were writing, and then just lines of code. We wanted to get done quickly and cleanly, but, you know, and I guess I still see the efficiency there. I just I'm not, I don't know that it would be stressed as much today. Well, I was thinking, uh, like I think about it in terms of math. Like you want to create a general way to do something, and then you expand it. Like when you're talking about matrices or something like Absolutely. that. And thinking about the Drew example, where Jeff went like mm -hmm. all around and then hit the point. If you think about that, like on a billion fold, mm -hmm. like that's when it starts. It's like like a, uh, that's a good point. So I mean, like. I, like I always teach in small, you know, matrices, we do two by twos or three by threes, but then I tell them, you know, when we're doing applications of this, computer systems are doing billions by billions, and so when you, you expand it or, I guess it's I don't know if I'm using it. It's not even more abstracted. Data's grown just as much. much. It's like in, in the Wall Street case where the, uh, the trading houses were getting the information to their computers a tenth of a second ahead of somebody else and it was worth millions of dollars to them because the computers were trading so fast. Mm -hmm. If you had an algorithm that worked faster than somebody else, you made the money. If you didn't, you lost the money. Right, right, right. right. And that's the algorithmic trading is a perfect example to bring up here. So, so the point I want to make across is the entire 4.2 is hard to teach. I'm telling you right up front. You don't get to it or you decide to say, I really didn't do my best, that's okay. It's hard to teach. Yes? And while I'm here, and I'm, I really am going to stop because I'm talking a lot, so um, I know that uh, we do the internet activity and then there's impact, which I'll do at Explore. So we really, you know, this otherwise gets boring. I, I will say this. We've talked a lot about the performance tasks. I want you to know that there will, or there's also a computer-based section of the exam. The AP, there is two sections. There's performance tasks that students do in the classroom, turn it in, then students go to the AP exam, like every other AP exam, and take a computer-based test, which is objectively scored, multiple choice, so on and so forth. The, the sections, the, uh, the questions for those are going to come from these learning objectives, right? So at some point, we've got to cover those in class and figure out how to do it. Our hope is, our scaffolding activities that we do, leading to the PT, also nails these elements. That's the only way you can manage class time, right? And it's a work in progress. We don't know if we can cover all the elements in class. We just do the absolute best we can, right? When we do SNAP, we will, do, we will be talking programming. When we do the internet activity this afternoon, we talk about the internet big idea. When I talk about the Explore PT, we talk about the impact behind it, right? And we talk about the pieces of that. 